In principle, we started last time, if you remember, with the Istanbul Protocol, and I want to invite you again to read it. It's a little bit long, but it has some chapters, and uh, you can also read up on the things that are especially important. You remember that it's, there's a general introduction. We have uh, talked about already about international legal standards, and we will hear more about that today. Also about the ethical guidelines we discussed on the obligation of physicians. Uh, dual obligations, especially when you feel you have to do something you are ordered to do, but it's in contradiction to medical ethics. We talked about the standards in medical ethics by the World Medical Association, and you will find them on the DVD you are getting. Yeah? There's all, most of these materials, or all of these materials, including the protocol, are on the DVD. I checked, there's still no official version of the uh, Istanbul Protocol in Greek, uh, so we are waiting for that. And it's a lot of work when we did the German version. It was more than two years of work for a whole team. So we are waiting for that. Then we talked about um, um, the um, psychological aspects in the interview. We said it's very important that, um, out of several reasons, to, to have a psychological awareness, even if you are a lawyer or a, a asylum official uh, or a pathologist, um, if you interact with victims who are traumatized, uh, the Istanbul Protocol stresses uh, several aspects why this psychological aspect in the interview is so important. First, you don't want to do harm. Yeah? You don't want to re-traumatize a person by creating an interview that is too stressful, too traumatizing like bringing up too many issues at the same time the person is overwhelmed with horrible memories, like when his wife was killed in front of him and his two children, and all memories come up. So that is important. You don't want to damage. The second thing is, if you want to get good results, good information, because people who are traumatized can be very confused, they can have lack of memory, um, problems with memory, and so it's very important if you create a good environment for the interview, then you get much better results, even if you are a lawyer. Yeah? And then it's even helpful to the client. So we said that's important. These are the general considerations for interviews also in the chapter in the Istanbul Protocol. And then we looked at some examples of how medical injuries look like. This is a big field. It's maybe not relevant for everyone for the non-medical staff, but you had an overview, and if you want to hear more about it, it's a full training of at least two or three days how to recognize scars. We said we, in the finding, you can have an observation like this is a scar, this is a sleeping problem, you might not have a diagnosis, but you can also put up a diagnosis, and then you have a conclusion. The conclusion means now must not mean this person was tortured on the 5th of March 2005. <laughs> yeah. That's medically difficult or impossible. Uh, but what you say is, is this consistent with the description? Could it be, does it fit very well to if the client has said, this was done with a knife and it's old, it's not fresh? This is what you can say and should say and you should also explain in the medical findings um, what are the limitations of your report? What are alternative interpretations? Because we mentioned already, and we are coming back to that, uh, negative finding must not mean the person is lying. It means that it's too long ago, the injury, to still prove it. It might be that the memory is confused because of psychological trauma. It might be that uh, the injuries need a different technique of investigation medically that you need, you heard about bone scintigraphy by Professor Mirsai, which is an advanced technique, which is, I think, existing here in any modern hospital. So you can use additional technique. And what should be in any examination is a psychological examination. Because, as I said, it's extremely important to know if someone has been traumatized. It might explain contradictions. And it's also very important to get him treatment if he's suicidal or has bad problems, he needs treatment. And finally, it's the most common psychological sequels 
are the most common and the most persistent sequels. Like if you look in the Cyprus u uh, ruling of the European Court on Human Rights on the 1974 issues, why were these 90 million euros granted? It was because of long-term psychological impact in the families. Uh? So it's not even about people who have been tortured, but it's about the families who are indirect victims. And the psychological long-term impact is the one that persists longest. And it's the most severe one sometimes, even if you have a scar that's unpleasant, but the real long-term impairment with many torture survivors, with some of them you have heard they have problems with their shoulder after hanging, there are a lot of physical problems, but the most common ones are very severe and psychological. So there should be a professional psychological, psychiatric, mental health examination in any examination. Huh? Um, this is a special chapter in the Istanbul Protocol. These are the psychological evidence. So there is quite a lot of different aspects we already have covered. And for today and tomorrow, we thought, based on the last um, two days we had before, that we would first, of course, cover the legal chapters, uh, which we know, our colleague knows, so he's a very well-known lawyer. He was for uh, several years the assistant to Professor Manfred Novak, who is uh, maybe the most internationally well-known lawyer on torture and the Istanbul Protocol and Human Rights, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture for many years. So they have seen uh, incredible numbers of cases also about the implementation of the protocol. And we are going to look at these legal chapters in a way that I think, uh, I hope everyone can understand. So it's a legal theme. <laughs> yeah? So don't worry, don't be afraid. Uh, I think this is understandable. And then we would have three more subjects, and this would be practice-oriented. Uh, we first cover what is in the Istanbul Protocol and the different aspects, and then we are going to look into concrete case examples. And we thought we discuss them in the group, because small group is difficult. We have too many people in the workshop, which is very nice, because it shows there is interest. And we are going to discuss it in the big group, and to take three examples on how to implement the Istanbul Protocol practically. Example number one is, of course, as we have said, Cyprus. Uh, to see what is already in the ruling, what is in the decision of the European Court, um, what are the typical things where we can compare with the Istanbul Protocol and international law. We would look into possible applications because there are many cases who have not been covered by this ruling. This is only about the family of the people who have vanished, but there are other cases too. So we are going to look into that, cover that, and discuss together also because we have a very good legal specialist here, how could it be taken up uh, to also cover other cases in Cyprus. The second case example, implementation example, which we will discuss would be um, to look a little bit about prison situations using an example from Austria probably, and uh, that we see how the investigation would be set up, an independent investigation, how you would go into a place of detention, it's not be a prison, it can be any place of detention, as one case example, uh, which is a chapter in the Istanbul Protocol. And then we would look into um, uh, the question of asylum and refugees, uh, because this is a big issue in Europe and also in Cyprus. And we would look in, we take a concrete case and you can play how to document it. I would be the victim, so you can document my injuries and uh, as a group and we discuss uh, how we use all these things we have seen uh, the last three days, how we do it practically, and then we go one step further and discuss what is a possible implementation in Cyprus. How to, could you, what is the present situation is the Istanbul Protocol applied already in asylum procedures in Cyprus? Yeah, because it's also a European uh, Union uh, framework, just like the Cyprus case. How is it implemented or is it not implemented? What could be done? How could it be concretely implemented in Cyprus? I think just as a, as a 
general idea, I think uh, what you learned this, this morning and throughout this day on admissibility, the different, uh, the different uh, what torture means and all those kinds of issues, I think only when you know those things, you can actually also read the case. I think to re just start reading a European Court of Human Rights case without any having any of the basic knowledge is very difficult. And it's also not so easy to read it like this because it's, I think, like 70 or 80 pages long. It's a lot of different things. And I mean, we're only going to focus on some part of it now. No? But uh, I think that's in order to be able to read it all, all helped already what you, what you learned this morning. Just as a very general, sorry, ideas. The, co the, co the case called Cyprus versus Turkey, the reason is because it is one of the rare interstate complaints. Most complaints you have in front of the European Court of Human Rights are an individual against the state. This was actually a state against the state. And the complaint arise, arose out of the uh, Turkish military operations in northern Cyprus, July, August 1974. And was basically the court uh, got four different categories of complaints from the government of Cyprus. And that was once violation in relation to the missing Greek Cypriots, the violation of the rights of enclaved C Greek Cypriots who are still li living in the north. And then on these two, I would like to focus. And I would like you uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to think about what human rights violations could be involved and if the case would be admissible if you now would want to file it in front of the European Court and how you would argue. And the, but there are, of course, two other groups um, of violations, and that's violation of Turkish Cypriots and the gypsy community in the north, and the violation of the home and property rights of displaced persons. But we can't do everything, and these are not so much something, uh, these are less related to what we learned this morning. So the question for you would be, based on the facts I present to you now, or whatever reading you want to do, first question would, how would you argue admissibility? And I will tell you how uh, uh, Cyprus argued, how Turkey argued, and how the court decided. And then um, on the merits, meaning on the substantive issues, what human rights could be violated. And then, of course, the issue of reparation that was decided very recently. Because on the merits, the court already decided 2001. So regarding the missing persons, the facts were 1,491 Greek Cypriots missing 20 years after the hostilities. Sorry? Yeah, this is just what the, ca what the case said at the time. Now, I'm sure there's, there's more now, but because there was also a commission on missing persons of the UN. So the, but at the, at the time, they only complained about this because it was an ongoing case, no? Well, it was filed in uh, 19 1994. 1994, yeah. yeah. So that's the 1994 data. Exactly, they, it's based on. Date of the application, 1994. It was clear that those people were missing as a result of the armed conflict. And Turkey didn't even say, no, that's not true. They, it was all acknowledged, no? Then there was a UN committee on missing persons set up 1981 that looked into the cases and established a list of missing persons and what happened to them, if they died, if, uh, uh, if the fate was known or not. And that's all known, and it's known that the Turkish government did not inform the relatives and did nothing to clarify the whereabouts and fate of the missing persons. So they stayed passive, among others, by saying, well, we have a committee on missing persons now. It's their responsibility. You know? Maybe on, on, uh, because this is not on the, on the slides, no? I just added this uh, yesterday. Um, so maybe looking into that, you can tell me what do you think, what kind of human rights violation could be triggered by that? And what kind of argument on the different admissibility criteria could be difficult? No? So that's the missing persons. And the second part is the living conditions of Greek Cypriots in the north. And the complaint that Cyprus brought forward is saying in the Karpas region, yes. there are 492, 429 persons living. Initially, there were 20,000 people. So only 429 people remained. And basically arguing, saying this is ethnic cleansing. No? I mean, uh, uh, people, um, people, uh, people are being uh, driven away to live there. No? And the same, they said, uh, goes for the Maronites. Uh, with 117 remaining in, as of 1994. And they said the reasons why all those people would leave and the problematic situation of those per persons is there's an absence of normal means of communication. 
there's a lack of secondary education. Basically, there is no secondary uh, schools for Greek-speaking persons. There's very severe restrictions to freedom of movement. And that's so far that, uh, first of all, uh, family visits had really difficulties to, 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 to visit, but also even when people would visit within different uh, uh, parts of a community, the police was partly following mm -hmm. and even going into the house with them to just stay and, uh, uh, and watch. No? So basically a very restrictive, very intrusive way of surveilling and restricting the freedom of movement. And also restricting, of course, family visits of their family from the south. No? And the impossibility of preserving property rights, which meant that basically if a Greek Cypriot died, there was no way that the son could inherit it. it if a, uh, when a Greek Cypriot died in the north, it would be declared as abandoned property. Is this correct? You see, would you agree with this presentation? Yes. OK, maybe tomorrow we can uh, look a little bit on what the ar were the arguments brought forward. And uh, I mean, I will try to discuss maybe also a little bit what was brought forward by, by uh, oh, Turkey, okay. because of course both states could always submit their observations, but uh, first of all I would like to of course know your opinion, no? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I look also about how the, um, if there's an indication of psychological or medical aspects, yeah, because there is, you find also special slides on that, they're called embedding, yeah, Cyprus, and you find some concrete uh, citations from the ruling which refer to the special questions, if you like. Yeah, and then we are going to take it up in 